Hello and welcome to today's live. My name is Helge Simon. I'm head of software engineering for the Envimet company. And today I want to talk about something, a core thing of every microclimate simulation, and that is model area, more specifically model area creation. I guess most of you are already familiar with model areas, but I want to take a bit of a deeper dive into them and what their structure is, what maybe common culprits are. Um, I'm very uh, eager to um, speak about them in two sections. First, in a theoretical part where we look at uh, the creation, etc., and then in a practical part where we head into spaces and actually create a model area based on the um, theoretical parts spoken before. And maybe if time allows, we even take a look at QGIS. As in all our lives, um, we are happy to receive questions at any time. So feel free to write them in the comments and I will get back to them at a later stage and try to answer them as thoroughly as I can. So let's first head into the theoretical part. And speak about model areas. Obviously, uh, they can look very differently depending on what your scope is. So they can be very high resolution when you maybe only take a look at a single building where you place some windows or rows of windows, have some undercuts, uh, a courtyard inside, etc. So this is especially the case for when you're interested in high resolution modeling of maybe building physics. But you can also, this is the most common case, analyze a city quarter. So have a resolution between two and maybe five meters where the buildings are um, parameter, where, where are approximated um, as, uh, as so-called 2.5D models. We're gonna talk about th this in a second. You have a, a high resolution of the trees as well, and you can replicate maybe a city quarter quite accurately to examine the human thumb comfort. Or you can go even coarser and go on to the urban area and check in a coarser resolution where heat stress might occur and in order to get an idea where local hotspots are located. So NVIMP model errors, they, they cover a very large space in, in or a large variety in their, in their form. And the topics today um, would be in the theoretical part. First, um, speak about the main 3D model and especially about a common corporate and common maybe tips and tricks about the vertical grid setup and then about gridding modes. In the second step of the theoretical part, we're going to take a look at model area files and the organization of the same. So how they're organized, uh, what is special about them. We take a bit of a deeper dive behind the scenes here. And Lastly, we want to take a practical approach. We want to open spaces and digitize a very small model area, take a look at the uh, theoretical uh, approaches here and what do they look actually in, in, in spaces and maybe if time allows, like I said, QGIS as well. So first off, obviously, uh, the main 3D model is represents the environment with voxels of different objects. And so every of these different voxels here which can vary in size, so typically resolutions are between two and five meters. They can either be part of a building or part of a plant or part of the soil or part of the atmosphere. And the user basically decides uh, which grid uh, pixel belongs to what. And for the vertical gridding, this is maybe the most important gridding because uh, you have typically a very large amount of X and Y cells, yeah? but your model area is not so high compared to, to the horizontal resolutions. So making, um, making up your mind about a good strategy on how to uh, grid vertically makes sense because from a computational effort with every grid cell you add in the vertical direction, um, the number of computational nodes um, goes up by X times Y and these are the large, large ones. So it makes sense to have a good strategy about the vertical gridding. And for that, and we met offers three different gridding modes. First off, in general, we recommend that the 3D model height should be roughly two times the highest building. So if your highest building in the model area is, let's say, 30 meters, your 3D model should be around 60 meters high. Yeah? 
if it's only a single building that is 30 meters and the rest of them are 20 meters, then maybe you, you get along with only having 50 meters of model height. But uh, this is a rule of thumb. And the um, different vertical gridding modes that we offer, they help you to get a good strategy about what to do uh, with the number of grid cells and also the resolution of the same in the vertical direction. So in the standard option, if you do not change anything, then typically Animate uses an equidistant grid with splitting. So what does that mean? So you, for example, say I want to have a um, delta Z of two meters, then all cells are two meters except because of the splitting option of the lowest cell. The lowest cell is split in five subcells, and these all are then 40 centimeters in resolution. And they have a higher resolution uh, because typically you're most interested in the, um, in the, in the effects on the, on the close to the surface because humans live there. You're not that much interested in what is the air temperature in, I don't know, 15 or 30 meters height. If your model area features very high buildings, for example, skyscrapers 200 meters high or more, then um, you, you can lose some of the um, accuracy, some of the uh, resolution, the higher up you go. Still, you're interested in the, in the close to the surface, uh, close to the surface values. So you have a high resolution down in the bottom and the higher up you go, the resolution gets coarser. So the third cell maybe have two, has 2.4 meters and then maybe 2.8 meters, et cetera, and goes up and up and up. Yeah? And then you save computational time because you do not need so many cells because they get higher, bigger and bigger and bigger. So you get to a higher height more quickly. And there's the option to start the telescoping only at a specific height. Because if you imagine there are trees down here, so there would be a tree here, then the tree would be quite distorted because of the very coarse resolution that starts even after the first grid, cells or grid cell already. And so it makes sense that the, you start the vertical gridding at a, only at a specific, the telescoping only, only a specific height. So for example, you say, okay, I want to start this at 30 meters and only then the grid cells should get bigger and bigger and bigger. Obviously, you can combine those, you can combine splitting with, for example, telescoping. So the lowest grid cell would be split in five subcells, yeah? And after, then it would be first with a desired uh, resolution, and then it starts to go up and up and up more quickly. So this is something to take in consideration, especially also if you're using a terrain, maybe we can talk about this uh, in the question sections uh, as well. So having a good vertical grid, uh, gridding setup quickly or hugely improves the computational time um, and uh, doesn't really affect the accuracy at all. And let's talk about the second theoretical part, and that would be gridding options. So Enumit offers two different modes of gridding. The first would be, and this is the standard, the so-called 2.5D model or the concept design. And there's also the 3D model and the detail design. 2.5D does not mean that you only have a 2D model. It is still fully 3D, but there are some, some um, shortcuts here that make life easier in, uh, let's say, 99% of the cases, you want to have a 2.5D model. And we'll take a look at what it is and why. First off, you have the three-dimensional grid. And to make life easy, they, they all every of this grid cell is two by two by two meters. And when you digitize, you decide, like I said earlier, that this cell is part of a building, this cell is part of a building, this, 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 and that. And so what Enumet could do and could store is, it could store, store that this index of the cell has a name basically, so it has an address, you could say. So on the X, it has one, two, three, four, five, five. On the Y, I'm not gonna count this, so let's say it is 10. And on the Z um, direction, it is one. And then you would say, okay, this is a building, building one with a facade, facade concrete. Yeah. 
So this is one way to, to store it, yeah? to store for every grid cell, store this information, what is this cell? If you're doing this this way, um, then you have all the information, that's great. But what, is, what would you do if you, for example, for some reason you notice, okay, there's one building that's quite high in the model area that reaches up until here, and you either need more Z cells, but you don't want that because then the computational time goes up. So you say, okay, let's not use two meters, but use maybe three meter resolution. Then this information where the where you have the individual um, where you have the individual uh, indices is not correct anymore because the indices they tell you that in five. 10, 1, which corresponds to 2 by 2 by 2, it would be building one and facade concrete. And this is not accurate anymore. So having a fixed grid, uh, we call this a detailed design, as culprits, if you ever want to change the vertical di dimension, and you quite often want to do this because you want to optimize it so that it runs faster. So this is the reason why the standard would be a 2.5D model. And what that is, we're going to talk about this now. The 2.5D means we have two dimensions, two real dimensions in this direction. So we call this the Y direction and this the X direction. And they are really there. And the 0 0.5 dimension, so half a dimension, would be the height. Because what we actually do is we write into the cell the height of the building of this building column in that cell. So this building here would be 11 meters. It doesn't matter if 11 doesn't exist, you have, for example, a three meter resolution or a two meter resolution. So 11 will never be possible based on the gridding because it can either be 10 or 12 meters. But you can write 11 here because uh, we do not actually store it explicitly, the height, but we store it in this grid. And then maybe this build, the building column would be 10 meters. This would also, oh, sorry, this would also be 11 meters. And this would be 12 meters again. Um, so what we store, is not the explicit cell indices, but instead we store the height of the building column at this place in X and Y. And now you can decide that this grid, th three-dimensional grid, should be a three by three by three meter grid or, or three by three by two meter grid, and Enumet can directly translate it on the fly. Yeah, the three-dimensional, so it is three-dimensional, fully three-dimensional, but um, there is a, it's a trick to um, not be dependent on the vertical resolution at the time of model area creation. So this is a very good thing to have the concept design. And again, here, I'd say in 99% of the cases, you would only want to have a 2D model. What does it actually imply? So why do we need 3D models? What, what is the difference now? Um, why do we need a detailed design at all if we have the 2.5D models? Well, yes, you have the possibility to change the vertical grid setup at any time. That's the that's a positive thing. But obviously, because we only store these cells here, the column heights, there is no information stored about where are windows because we only store these numbers of the height of the column. So we have no information. Is here a window in two meters height up until four meters height or not? Is there, um, I don't know, maybe a, a brick wall or something? So all these information about windows uh, or differences in the facade, individual elements of the facade is not possible to store. Yeah? So this goes away. Uh, so this goes out the out the window, yeah, so to speak. And uh, this is not possible to store. And also no overhanging structures are possible. I mean, with some, with some exception, we're going to talk about this in a second. So if you imagine here would be a balcony sticking out, yeah, then uh, how would I store this? Because it, if I stored it here and I'd say, okay, this is the top of the balcony, it would be uh, maybe 10 meters, yeah then this would assume that these two cell columns both go up to 10 meters, yeah? We see in a second that this, for one balcony is possible, for two it's not possible, but uh, we're gonna talk about this in a second. However, what is possible even with 2.5D models is that the whole building, so all this facade, all these facades here are, they can be of, for example, brick, 
while of this building, all the facades are concrete. These might be plaster, and of this building, it might be a different material after all. The same obviously goes for the roof. So you can assign different roofs and different facades for the whole building, but not for individual facades if you're using the 2.5D models. Let's now come to the trick on how to create these um, balconies or maybe undercuts, walkways underneath the building. So you see here, this is a 2.5D model and we created something like a walkway through the building. How did we do this? How do we store it? Well, we have two matrices, two X and Y matrices. Yeah, so Y, X, Y, X. And in one, we store the height of the building. So the top of the building. So this would be 10 meters high. Yeah. So here it would be a 10 and it would be a 10 everywhere where this building is. Let's say it's only that, oh, sorry, only that big Yeah. So 10, 10, 10, 10. And here we store the bottom of the building and this would be zero, zero, and maybe this uh, archway, it is, it starts at four meters. So this archway would go from four meters up to 10 meters. Yeah? And this is the way to store um, something like this or maybe balconies or something. But to have maybe two archways on top of each other. So if we imagine this would be my building, sorry. And I would want to have another archway. Yeah? then we would need two more of these uh, matrices and th then it becomes not usable anymore. You need so many matrices that there's no saving in, in, um, in storage or something anymore. So if you actually want to have multiple balconies on top of each other or uh, yeah, walkways or you know, undercuts of a building on top of each other or actually windows or something, you need to go to a full 3D model to a so-called detailed design. So then you can obviously, every facade can have a different um, material. It can be very complex structures. So you see all these indentations of the buildings, yeah? Um, different uh, glasses, for example, this is a different glass than this one or that one. Um, however, the, the downside is once you created this full 3D design, you are fixed with this vertical setup. So you cannot go back from a full, 3D model to a 2.5D model without data loss. Yeah? So basically when you reconvert this building back to a 2.5D model, it looks like a shoebox again. Yeah? So I would, like I said, in 99% of the cases for outdoor thermal comfort, it doesn't really matter where these windows are yeah? or the, the um, additional work that goes into building this does not justify the increase in accuracy at all. So I would not recommend um, uh, using 3D models except for maybe very rare occasions where um, they might make sense, um, but to use 2D models. And if you want to use 3D models, so detailed designs, you be, need to be absolutely sure that you will not change the vertical grid after you convert it to the uh, 3D um, detailed design. Okay, um, I guess we can maybe just have some questions here before we start into how the data is stored. And for that, I'll go back here. And I can come up with the questions. Good afternoon, sir. What would be the most appropriate resolution to simulate an urban area and have reasonable computing time? Well, um, that depends. So it's actually not that much important what the resolution is, but the number of cells. So if your model area is maybe, let's say a typical size would be maybe 400 by 400 meters, then I would go for maybe two or 2.5 meters resolution uh, for all three dimensions. So maybe let's say two meters, that's easier to, to calculate. So your model area is 400 by 400 meters. You can easily, do a calculation then with two by two meters horizontally and also vertically. So you'll end up with uh, 200 by 200 grids and vertically maybe in the range, typically the range is around 35 uh, grid cells. And this would uh, calculate a reasonable amount of time. Typical resolutions for, um, yeah, ur for urban design studies are between, like I said, two to five meters um, in X and Y and in Z maybe uh, two to three or 
maybe four meters, because you want to have a quite high resolution vertically because many processes, they also um, change vertically. So that makes sense. What would happen if I choose a lesser height than the two times? Okay, ah, yeah, okay. Um, that that go, belongs to the gridding, gridding, um, vertical gridding. Um, well, you can go uh, lower than two times the height of the highest building. The the thing is, um, numerical instabilities can happen. I mean, if you imagine, there there is there's the building, and then the air comes, and it is displaced upward. And if the model boundary, the 3D model, is very close to the top of the building, then the air is directed upward, but it has nowhere to go. Yeah, it has, it, it can exit the model, but if it exited the model, then we had uh, negative pressures there, there. So it would lose mass all the time and it would suck in more air. So it needs to have some air to flow around the building smoothly. So that is the reason why we typically recommend to more or less two times the height of the highest building. Um, but like I said, there are exceptions uh, if there's only a couple of buildings um, higher than others. Now, in general, maybe the, all the buildings are 20 meters, but there's only one sticking out four, uh, with 40 meters, then you're probably okay with going to uh, 60 meters height or maybe 65 to 70 meters. So what can happen is numerical instabilities. Uh, Peter Paul asks, oh, you just talked about terrain and vertical gridding. Does it make sense at all to use splitting when terrain is added to the model area? Very good question. Um, yes, in most cases, it, it doesn't make sense to use um, splitting when you're using terrain. Because when you're using terrain, there um, only the, the lowest grid cell is, is split. So it's not the lowest atmosphere grid cell that is split, but it's the lowest grid cell that is split. So um, there's basically only the ones that are really to the close to the border of the of the model. They, these ones get the the benefit of having higher resolution, and this is typically when you're using a terrain, very few cells. So it makes only a sense to to use splitting when you're not using a terrain, and you can save the computational effort of having not to compute five more grid cells. Another question would be, uh, how many grid cells should be left on the sides of the model? Yeah. So we talked about the gap to the vertical model. For the for the horizontal um, boundaries, I'd say half the height maybe of the um, of the adjacent buildings. So if you have a building of ten meters, then five meters should be enough. Yeah. Um, this can also be expressed maybe in, in uh, not in absolute values of meters, but also in grid cells. So I'd always leave two or three grid cells empty at the model border. Um, obviously, if you leave vast amounts of empty area, this is not, uh, not just uh, unrealistic, but um, uh, you would also uh, have the air temperature or all the parameters change over while they're coming in and they uh, are approaching the, uh, the next building or something, the air temperature would vary because obviously um, there uh, is open space where it, it shouldn't be. So let's say three grid cells and uh, would be one of the rule of thumbs or um, half of the adjacent um, buildings. So there's another question. Just to be sure, if I enter dx and dy1, my model geometry, does that mean that each cell drawn is one meter in size? Yes. Yeah. So then, uh, uh, like horizontally, yeah. So the, this is the gap between two cells and the distance. So the, the pen here would be one meter in this direction and one meter in this direction horizontally. And depending on what you do in, in, in vertical, uh, in the vertical resolution too. If you're using one meter, um, your model areas are going to be quite small. So I would not go below one meter. One meter would be the absolute minimum I'd go. And also for the vertical, if you go for one meter for dz, I would not use splitting because the effect of the close to the boundary layer, like close to the surfaces, is already very well captured um, because the computational node is always in the middle. So if these are the boundaries, the computational node is here. So um, it's only half a meter, the computational um, 
uh, no, uh, only half the uh, resolution is the distance between the object, a wall, for example, and the computation node. So it's half a meter. So um, it's already very well captured and I'd not re recommend using splitting if you're having a, such a high resolution of one by one by one meters. All right, um, so there aren't any further questions. So I'd say um, let's get back to um, the, the theoretical um, background before we head to the actual application. Um, so the model area files, what are they? Um, basically, you all stored them, I guess, already. Um, and uh, you looked at them this way, yeah. So in maybe in spaces, and what you're seeing here that every cell holds, depending on the topic, some information. So these cells here, you're now looking at the vegetation, yeah. So these cells are empty, though. So there's no information in these cells. And then in this cell, for example, there's some information. And what is this xx? So it's, the x is just the ending of a database ID, and this stands for a specific. Um, item in our database. I'll come to that in a second. And these files, this graphical representation that you see in spaces or maybe of any of our plugins, they what they actually are are text files. So our um, our model area input files with the ending, they have the ending oh, inx. Yeah, they have the ending inx. Um, they are actually text files that save all the data that you put in. So for example, you can open them in Notepad or something and read them as a human being. Yeah. So it's, this is just a graphical representation of a text file. So you see uh, our dx, dy, and dz is 2 by 2 by 2 meters. We have 10 by 10 by 30 meters. And there is the splitting seems to be switched on. The vertical stretch and telescoping is, um, is off. And um, yeah, you see the location. It's in Essen, Germany, seven degrees longitude, 53 degrees latitude, and so on. So it's actually a text file. We're going to look at one in a second and see uh, some yeah, deeper dive, like some tips and tricks how you can uh, also change them in the text editor. But obviously, I say it now, I'll say it later again. Be aware that if you tinker around with this um, and you, for example, delete one of the um, yeah, one of the uh, elements here or enter something that is not valid, then obviously the file is corrupt. So you should be, uh, you should always have a copy of it and be aware of what you're doing. Um, I want to uh, stress a bit more on, onto this um, for now. So if I have the, the vegetation view and I place an XX here, that just markers that this cell is, in this case, an XX, is the database ID 0200XX and all because for the simulation, obviously, we need all these information about physical properties, albedo, emissivity, transmittance, plant height in this case. Yeah, they are not stored in the INX file. They are not stored um, in the um, in the model area file, but on our database. And they, so they link together. Yeah, so the database that comes with NVMED, the system or the system elements. Yeah. Um, you can choose from. They hold then the information about the physical properties. That just that's just a reminder, I guess. It's clear uh, for most of you already. Okay, let's see if we have uh, more questions before we head into um, actually applying and we met. So. Uh, oh, there's only one more question. Um, hello. Regarding the grid cells at the borders of the model, should we use nesting grids or leave empty cells? Yeah. Um, so there is the option to use nesting cells. Um, we don't recommend using them because um, the better option is to use empty cells because if you're using nesting grid, the nesting output, um, you can incorporate them, but uh, typically what you, you define some properties of the air that should flow into the model. And if you were to use nesting, these properties would change over the area that is outside your 3D model domain, the nesting grids. So for example, you want air to be 23 degrees centigrade warm when it enters the three-dimensional model domain. If you're, sorry, if you're using nesting, however, then uh, this air temperature might rise or drop to some other value and then enter the model area. 
So the better option would be to use empty cells, um, two or three empty cells, like I said before, and not uh, use nesting grid cells. And one more question came in. Is there a way to digitize the process of model area, model creation? Example, can I input a file? If so, in which format? That contains the data on building heights and other dimensions that NVMet could use to create. Yes, a very good question. Yes, there is this opportunity or this is this possibility. Um, and um, we'll take a look at it in a second. In the easiest way, I think, is using uh, the QGIS plugin because QGIS is a free and open source software. You can download it. Um, from their website, we're going to take a look at this in a second. And there you can basically input a gazillion amount of different data formats of uh, geodata that you have, of building data, of vegetation data, of surface data. And you, you can use this uh, information to create an environment model area very quickly of a large domain, uh, whatever you desire. We, um, I hope we'll have the time to look at this at a later stage today. All right, um, oh, there's one more question. Do you have a service to help people which have a business license about specific questions? Yes, we do. Um, so actually there is uh, one and a half ways to do this. So um, uh, business licensees uh, and also other, all other users, we encourage them to use obviously our forum. So uh, head over to nv-hq.com. There, so there's this forum and Actually, the forum is maybe the preferred way uh, because there is a huge community and you get the question, the, the answer very, very quickly from many people and people will download um, or would take a look at the, the problem or the question you have. So this is one option. The other option would be a CRM at mv-met.com, a web uh, email address that uh, business uh, licensees can also take a look at. Um, my preferred way would be um, the, the, the forum, however. And then there's one more question. Can you recommend an efficient grid structure for an area placed on terrain with height variation? Um, yeah, that is not so easy. So if you have a very high, you know, very large height variation, obviously if you were to use um, uh, telescoping inside the terrain, then it tele the terrain would also get telescoped. And this is not something that you want. So um, for that, we would always recommend uh, using telescoping, yes, but um, the starting height of the telescoping should be well out of the area that affects that is affected by the terrain. So if your terrain has a variation of, let's say, 30 meters, then the starting height where the telescoping should start, it should not start below 30 meters, maybe not even below 40 meters, because obviously on top of the 30 meter high uh, terrain, there might be a building that you don't want to stretch uh, too much. So um, use a, a, a starting height for the telescoping. It's well above. OK, this seems to be it for the questions right now. And then I'd say, let's go to the hands on in spaces. I'll try to make um, this quick so that maybe we also have some time to look at the or to answer the question about the, the data model area creation process um, in a second. So we now um, take a look at Spaces, the very own program that ships with Enrimat to create voxel-based model areas. So this should look quite familiar to you. Um, obviously, when you start with a new model domain, you um, enter this, uh, you open this dialog, and in this dialog, you're asked to locate the model area on Earth. Um, the name of the location is just important for you um, so that you recognize it again. But what is really important is obviously the latitude and longitude, because this depends or this determines um, the uh, sun position. Yeah, These two parameters are very important. This text field is not important at all. It's just for you. And obviously, the reference longitude is important too. So the reference longitude gives you an idea about uh, the time. So for example, where does the what, what is the time on your local watch uh, depending on where is the sun right now? So the reference longitude at the UTC plus one time in, in Germany, Germany is UTC plus one. So the sun at 12 o'clock in noon yeah, 
uh, when the clock in, in Germany says 12 o'clock, the sun is actually not directly above you in the highest position, but it is at the highest position at 15 degrees um, to the east. And um, because this is not a, a thing that you might know by heart, we have the find location option and you can uh, use geonames of Google to uh, say, okay, let's, oh, let's not go to Germany again, but maybe New York, um, search for it, you get the geodata and then you see, okay, longitude, uh, latitude, and this is the reference long, uh, longitude, then you can select the location and the model area is, uh, the, the, the values are filled there. Then the model geometry, this is something that we talked about before. So this would be the parameters that you can change. This is X, Y, and Z, obviously. And here are the options that we talked before about talked about before in the um, vertical gridding. Um, and the vertical gridding would be uh, either the splitting is on, like I said, this is the default option. You can, you can combine it with a telescoping. This would be the starting height. This would be the factor, um, how high the building, um, how high the model area stretches for our Demonstration now, I just use splitting and I apply it here. And um, I want to digitize some buildings and see the difference of 2.5D and 3D. So this is my one building, and then there's another building, maybe 10 meters high. Oop. Oh, not that pretty, but doesn't matter. And uh, yeah, maybe a third one. Why not 15 meters? So what you see here, is I have a two meter resolution, but still I wrote five meters, which is never possible in two meters, obviously. Um, and and uh, 10 meters is possible and 15 uh, is not possible either. So this um, is the benefits of a 2.5D area, a 2.5D model creation. I can always change it and it will grid on the fly. So if I um, click here, I get the model information. If I hover over the building, you see the building Number, I didn't, there's no name because I didn't give them the name. You see how high are the buildings and what is the wall and roof material. And by default, this is just the default wall and roof material for all three buildings. If I look at them at 3D, um, you see the buildings here and we can also see the splitting. Yeah, you see here that the splitting, the lowest cell is split. And for these three buildings now, I can give them different uh, materials. And the way I do this in the D, in the concept design, the 2.5D model, is I select the building. So this building is now selected. And now I give, I, for example, want to give this building a concrete cast dense and let's say uh, roof tiles. And then I say, apply these materials to that building. And I select this building. Um, maybe I want to give this building a glass. Why not glass, yeah, and the same roof, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't matter right now. And that building, I want to give this building um, concrete again, but also greening. And so I not only apply the materials, but also apply the greening. And if I look at this in 3D, you see by indicated by the different colors that they now feature these different um, materials and greening. I cannot, however, place a window here. And you see that because this is grayed out. And in order to not have this grayed out, I need to convert this model into a full 3D model. So I do this by going to, to edit and then convert to detail design. And here you get a warning. And this is the warning I was talking about. Um, when you do go to a detail design, you should be absolutely sure that uh, you will not change the vertical dimensions or the vertical resolution of your model again. Because if you need to go back, there will be data loss. Yeah? So I now changed it. I go back to 3D. And now I have the option to edit individual segments. So let's say no greening. I just want to place some windows. Yeah, why not clear flow glass? And yeah, I can place some windows here. Oop. I can also, if I hold shift, I can replace more than one cell at uh, once. And you see that this applies then. So um, this is the, the option then in a full 3D model. But again, I know I said it already, in 99% of the cases, the effort doing this does not uh, yeah, justify the, the increase in accuracy of the model. So if I were now to change the vertical resolution, just so that you see it, uh, 
you get the warning. You get the warning that now data loss will occur. Do I really want to do this? Do I really want to change the vertical resolution because yeah, I want to save computational time or something like that? Yeah. So if I were to say yes, then I would go back. All the information about the windows is lost again. Yeah. Yeah, that's the that's obviously the downside of it. Yeah. Um, okay. So this would be the things I wanted to show. Oh, there are more questions. Can we model a whole city with Enrymat? Well, it depends on your computational um, time. Yeah, uh, on your on your PC, and obviously on on the um, on the, uh, the resolution. So what we did uh, is we modeled um, huge parts of Berlin and other cities already. So model area with a quite competent computer uh, would be possible to simulate maybe five by five kilometers. That's not a big problem to, to simulate. If you have a, a quite quite pont, a potent, a potent computer, um, then that is possible, yes. Um, but then um, the resolution would be maybe seven or eight or maybe 10 meters, yeah. Um, so um, it, it really depends. Most of the cases, it is a microclimate model. So most of the cases, you're more interested in the fluctuations that are smaller, um, uh, that are more local. So um, going even bigger is not necessarily, necessarily being better. So um, maybe then simulating sm more smaller model areas of that city might make, make more sense. Really depends. Is there an undo button in spaces? No, there is unfortunately no undo button in spaces because it's quite tricky. Um, you basically create so many timelines then um, that no, unfortunately there's no uh, no undo button in spaces. So that is also the reason why we recommend that you save your model area quite often. So um, I would now also save my model area um, basically after, yeah, always after a couple of steps. Um, and before I want to show spaces, I, I promised you that we also take a look at uh, the file that is created, but you obviously you can do so at home too. Um, so the file that we created in uh, just now was a 50 by 50 by 25 model. I just opened the INX file in the text editor. And what you can see here, if I highlight the zeros, so this says the building top, where is the building top stored? And in the 2.5D models, you see here yeah, there's five meters, 10 meters, 15 meters. I could easily change this to four, or I can also do this obviously with search and replace, yeah? So this way I can, and if I now save the model, then this building would be five meters here and four meters there. So this would be entirely possible to do. Um, and this would be the building bottom where you have the undercut. So feel free to, to take a look at the uh, at your um, uh, text file, uh, your model, model input files in the text editor. You might learn some things, but be obviously aware that if you delete this, yeah, and play some, if you write something there, then it will be corrupt. Yeah, so I would not recommend doing this um, if you only have a single copy of the file. So be aware that changing these values, they need to be the file needs to be um, make, make needs to make sense in the end. Yeah, so um, do this with with caution, please. Um, okay, so now quickly, I want to go to the QGIS plugin because uh, there was a question about it. So you can download QGIS. Um, From, from their website. If you just Google QGIS, it's, it's free and open source to, to, uh, to download. And um, if you have QGIS here, so this is the, um, the QGIS uh, surface, uh, and you can install a plugin yeah, using the plugin repository. And when you look for NVMAT, you see this geodata NVMAT, it's a plugin, and you can install the plugin. It only takes a second, then you get this button here. And if I now load geodata into my model, and I did so for Berlin, for example, so this would be geodata that I downloaded from the city of Berlin. It's 
free, uh, freely avail available. Uh, and I add maybe a, a background satellite map. You see that these are all the buildings of Berlin. And um, I, because the, the time is quite short, I'm not going to um, do it step by step here, but rest assured there is a YouTube tutorial on our um, YouTube channel that uh, is a three part series that just covers this plugin on how to use it and um, does it all these uh, different features step by step. And there's also obviously a documentation on our website. So when you open the Qtus plugin, you get this link here. So um, there is plenty of learning material out there in a three part series in our YouTube channel. Um, Okay, so uh, what I do here, what I need to define is, and I really do this just quickly, is a, a polygon that tells um, us where should, which part of the city should be um, ex exported to um, to Envimet, yeah? And uh, so I just need to quickly draw a rectangle. Um, why not of here, yeah? the Unter den Linden and uh, the Berlin Gate. So this is my area to be to be modeled. And then I go to export. Like I said, I'm just doing this quickly over here. There's a YouTube uh, tutorial that goes into depth uh, about this. Here you set up the X and Y resolution. Let's, let's say, oh, this is a quite a large model area, so it might take a long time to load. So I um, make this, this a bit smaller. Let's make it that that big. Um, so it will end up being a resolution of two meters, maybe two by two meters, and and this would be 170, uh, 157 by 259 grids. A good resolution. I say, okay, the buildings are stored in the building layer with a height, and I don't want to add the vegetation right now because it um, it's just for demonstration purposes. Um, and I just tell it to store it in Berlin with a very good file name, save the INX. So it's now exported and I can open it here and you see the, whoop, quite close. Yeah. You see that there is this model area. Yeah. All the buildings are imported. Um, and obviously, the I didn't export the trees right now, but they could be also here, the surfaces, etc. So this is one way to to, um, to export and use the, the plugin. Um, let's look if we have more questions. Uh, where was I? There. Can I run two simulations at a time on the set? Yes, you can. Yeah. Obviously, if you are if you do have a license of Envimet, then it will run in multi-core. So what that means it will take all the uh, cores that are available to the simulation. So if you have a, let's say 16 cores in your PC, then it will the first simulation will take all the 16 cores, and then you maybe at a later stage you start the second simulation. Then after that they will share the the computational power of the computer. So they will switch up using the 16, then simulation A uses 16 cores, then the next second B uses 16 cores, and so on and so forth. So, so it looks, so it, it runs a bit slower, obviously, but not all the um, computational loops will use all the cores all the time. So it will not run twice as, or half as fast, or twice as slowly, same thing. So, um, but uh, it will run a bit slower if you run two simulations and on the same PC, but not half as long. So it makes sense, yeah. Um, obviously, the the um, RAM, the, the memory, um, this is also something to think about then. Um, is it, it would be impossible to put a, the window on each building if I want to model. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Um, yeah. You can, there is not just the, so the QGIS bucket will always write a 2.5D model. The uh, other plugins, for example, the uh, Morpho plugin, and I think the um, SketchUp plugin too, I'm not 100% sure, it is able to write full 3D models. Um, 
And then obviously you can have, if you have the information in your, in your base data of the location of the buildings, then they can be imported. Like I said, it, I mean, obviously for visualization purposes, yes, that makes sense. But other than that, I would not recommend yeah, the effort. It's not really worth the effort um, based on the results of the accuracy of the results. They are not worse um, if you do not have the location of the windows at all. What you can do and what we uh, also suggest to do is if you look at the database manager, there are materials that have the windows mixed in. For example, if you have a concrete facade and half of the facade is made out of windows, um, then we have uh, um, in the database manager of every element installation, the system um, elements in materials, you'll see that there's material that does exactly this. So it, it averages the uh, parameters, the physical parameters, based on the area covered of a facade of different materials. So that's possible, and then you don't lose basically any information about it. So if you're really eager to incorporate these very tiny nuances, then this might be an option. What um, This is Notepad++. It's a very good text editor. I can definitely recommend it. Is there a plugin for Blender? Yeah, uh, for Blender. Currently, uh, it's not publicly available, but there is, uh, there will be at some stage, I guess, a Blender plugin. Uh, however, only for visualization purposes, not to build the area right now. Um, yeah. Is it possible to do the opposite path from Envid to QGIS? Yes, that's possible. Yeah. You can load Envid simulation results in QGIS, no problem at all. Um, I'm not going to show uh, today, I think, what uh, in the tutorial video that I was talking about that is on our uh, YouTube channel, a three-part series called Geodata to Internet, I think. Or if you go to our channel and, and look for uh, QGS, you will see um, it's entirely possible. And you can do all the different crazy stuff with it. So you can load all the data and uh, make ISO lines, make very nice visualizations that are geolocated. Um, so it's very good. And the curious can later also change. Yes, that's possible. Yeah. So this is one of the options, obviously. So in the QGIS bucket, you will get a 2.5D model. And based on the 2.5D information that I showed you earlier, so I, I loaded the model in 3D, you can then change to 3D. And this is one of the options. Only change the buildings that are close to the area of interest. Because normally, if you have a big model area, let's say 500 by 500 meters, you're not interested in all the area, but only part of the area. And um, this uh, part of the area that you're highly interested in, there you can place windows, obviously. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah. Will you have any plugin for Archicad software? Right now, we don't. Um, I can't promise we won't. <laughs> um, so uh, it's entirely possible that um, something like this will, will be developed. But uh, currently, uh, no, Archicad is not in there. Okay, um, so one more question here. If I want to simulate the thermal comfort of a residential area in the old city of Berlin, should I not model it in any matter? Instead, should I find the location of the community from here as I just now in application? Yes, that's possible. Yeah. So if you, I mean, in QGIS, you can find actually there are forums and everything. Um, that have historical information about cities. Berlin is one example where there is lots of data available. Um, also from Google, they can, there's a timeline you can go back to, I think, 1920 or something, and uh, have then the geodata of um, Berlin. And uh, yeah, so you can wind back in time. We actually, we do have a model of um, ancient Rome at the time, 200 BCE, yeah? Um, no, sorry, 200 CE, so 200... Um, after um, uh, Christ, and there you um, we we can use it to simulate the urban climate in ancient Rome. Yes, that's possible. Uh, Intel has a new architecture of process P course, performance course, and E course, efficient course. Um, yeah, there's. It's hard to tell. Uh, right now, I think the AMD Threadripper are the way to go. I mean, based on 
the uh, efficiency, uh, especially cost versus number of cores and, and speed of cores. Um, the P, P uh, cores are interesting, definitely. P and both P and E cores from Intel. Um, we currently um, are more satisfied with the uh, with the larger Threadripper cores from AMD. They have um, up to 5.2 gigahertz of turbo or something. So yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for your um, yeah for for attending and also for your question. It was, was really great for me. And um, yeah, I'm uh, happy to see you online. Thank you and goodbye.